next we have coming up, what to expect when you are expecting a liver transplant. Oh, thanks. Um, so with this discussion, we have Dr. Elizabeth Carey, who also is grateful enough to uh, uh, join us for the family care partner discussion. Um, she's going to give us a bit more discussion about what to expect when you're expecting a liver transplant and answer some of your questions. So uh, we welcome her up to the stage. And uh, don't forget, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them into the Whova app and uh, tag this uh, specific discussion. Thanks, Dr. Carey. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for inviting me to speak today. It's really an honor. Um, I guess there is a little bit about me. So I am a transplant hepatologist at Mayo Clinic Arizona, which is kind of just north of here, about 20 minutes away. If you're not from Arizona, welcome to Arizona. You came at the perfect time of year. I hope you're really enjoying the weather. It really doesn't get any better than this. My practice is about 50% general hepatology, where I specialize in PBC and PSC, and then about 50% transplant hepatology. And I've been fortunate enough to be at Mayo Clinic Arizona since the transplant program started in 1999. And that year, we did kind of a handful of transplants. I just realized we're coming up on our 25-year anniversary um, this summer. And last year, we were the biggest program in the country. So I've been very, very fortunate with my career. And I'm very passionate about transplant hepatology. It's a fantastic field if you have anybody going into medicine. So. Um, what to expect when you're expecting a liver transplant. Some of our patients might look pregnant, but unfortunately they're not. I don't have any financial disclosures um, in terms of off-label usage of um, medications. I will talk about sirolimus, which is an immunosuppressant, which is indicated. It's FDA approved for kidney transplant, technically not FDA approved for liver transplant. And the things that I'll review are just kind of general indications for listing or when it's time to think about liver transplantation. Once you're listed, kind of what to expect during that time. I'm going to spend some time going over the possible donor organ options because that has really, that's an area that um, we have a lot more choice now than we used to and it can be kind of confusing the first time you hear about all these options. I'll just talk a little bit about life after liver transplant and then give you some tips and some resources on how to choose a transplant program. So I will start by saying that nobody wants a liver transplant. But when you need it, it's a really, really great option. And I hope if there's nothing else that you take from my talk today, um, yes, transplant, liver transplant is a major life change, but people do really, really well after a liver transplant. People have really normal lives. We have kindergarten teachers who are transplant recipients. We have professional athletes. We have pilots. We have doctors. Your life after transplant should be exactly how you want it to be, minus taking some medications and getting your labs on a regular basis. So this slide has a lot of information on it. It's the changes in the trends for liver transplantation for PBC since um, from 1988 to 2021. The gray bars indicate the total number of liver transplants done for people with PBC. And the black line indicates the percentage of total liver transplants that are done for people with PBC. And I also kind of put on there just for reference, UDCA or so was approved in 1987. It was approved for PBC in 1996. And then abeticolic acid came in 2016. So when we look at the gray bars, which is the total number of transplants done for people with PBC, that kind of steadily decreased after Urso was introduced. And then we've seen kind of a rise over the past decade. But the percentage of liver transplants for PBC continues to decrease, such that now only about 2% of liver transplants are done for PBC. But nevertheless, um, PBC remains a very common, I guess I shouldn't say very common, but um, it remains an indication for liver transplantation, and we see a lot of PBC pe people needing liver transplantation. So when do we start to talk about liver transplant? Well, people with cirrhosis can live in what we call a compensated state for many years, and that means that they have cirrhosis, but the liver is functioning normally. It's doing all the jobs that it needs to do. When the liver starts to decompensate, that's when we start to talk about transplant. And the, the um, symptoms of decompensation, I'm sure you've heard of, things like variceal hemorrhage from esophageal or gastric varice, varices, 
the development of ascites or fluid in the abdomen. Hepatic encephalopathy, uh, sometimes people call that a brain fog where toxins that are normally cleared in the liver are not, they get in through the blood-brain barrier into the brain and make people kind of foggy. And hepatorenal syndrome where the kidneys are affected by the liver dysfunction and people can actually need dialysis. That's the most common time that we think about liver transplantation um, in people with PBC. It's when the liver starts to decompensate. However, some people can develop hepatocellular carcinoma or HCC as we frequently call it. That can occur either with compensated or decompensated cirrhosis. Um, that's an indication for liver transplantation. Every once in a while, we see somebody who's clinically doing quite well, but nevertheless, their MELD score is 15 or higher. And even though they might not have ascites, might not have hepatic encephalopathy, just having that high MELD score portends uh, a higher mortality risk. So that's a reason to start thinking about transplant. And there are some quality of life indications for liver transplantation, such as refractory pruritus. But as I'll talk about in a minute, it can actually be hard to achieve transplant for that, even though it's considered an accepted indication. In terms of what to expect when you go for evaluation, now this is going to vary from program to program, and it will probably vary a lot. But in general, this is kind of what to expect, and this is reflective of our program at Mayo Clinic Arizona. Um, and I have these in two columns, but really it's kind of all jumbled together. Um, usually the first thing is a general medical assessment, usually done by someone like me, a transplant hepatologist. And in that time, we're trying to find out what kind of complications you've had from your liver disease, what your quality of life is as it relates to your liver disease. We want to know about your past medical history, what medications you take, um, family history, just kind of a general medical assessment. You'll also meet with a transplant surgeon who will talk, obviously, about all of the surgical details, the complications. Um, they'll, talk, they'll kind of review your imaging and your particular history and let you know if you have any particular risk of the surgery that might be higher because of your anatomy or prior surgeries or something. Uh, we always look at imaging of the liver, not only for surgical planning, but also people with cirrhosis have an increased risk of developing liver cancer, so that's always something that we're looking for. Dental evaluation is actually very important. It's a common site of unknown infections, and if those are not addressed before transplant, at the time of transplant, when high-dose immunosuppression is started, those um, infections can actually turn into very sy severe systemic infections. Cardiac testing is also super important. A liver transplantation is probably the most physiologically stressful surgery that there is. Um, so people have to have a good heart simply to make it through the surgery. So we're very careful with cardiac testing. We check lung function. Every um, candidate or who's going through evaluation sees an infectious disease doctor because, again, we don't want any undiagnosed infections to rear their rug ugly heads right after transplant when we're least expecting it. And age-appropriate cancer screening is important. We don't look for every possible cancer, but we make sure that women are up to date on things like mammograms and pap smears, that everybody's up to date on colon cancer screening, those sorts of things. And then the psychosocial evaluation for liver transplant is just as important as the medical evaluation. So all of our people in evaluation see a social worker. People who have any history of any type of substance abuse will see an addictions counselor. Everybody sees a transplant psychiatrist. We have a financial counselor who can help our patients understand kind of what their co-pays might be, what their insurance is going to cover pre-transplant, post-transplant. We always make sure patients know what their transplant medications are going to cost after transplant because sometimes that can be a difficult thing to predict. Everybody sees a nutritionist or a dietitian. Um, in some people, that's a more important assessment than others, but that's a mandatory part of the evaluation. And um, we don't do this routinely, but it's becoming more and more common for a palliative medicine consultation to be part of the transplant evaluation, not because we're not expecting you to make it, but because there's a lot of data showing that incorporating palliative care into traditional um, care, cancer care, liver care, actually improves patient outcomes. And so that's something that we are starting to incorporate more and more. And I'd also remind you, you know, the focus is on you as a possible candidate, but this is also your opportunity to evaluate the program. 
And programs really vary a lot. I know I talked to one gentleman earlier whose wife is listed at three different programs, and he can probably tell you that there, I'm guessing there are probably significant differences between those three programs. Every program has a personality, and, and you want to know that your personality fits with the program's personality. So I will talk a little bit about the philosophy of organ allocation. So when liver transplantation first started, it was all about the wait list. When you went through evaluation, you got put on the wait list and you sat there until your time was up and then you got the next organ. And the problem with that is that there were some people who remained very stable, but they marched up the list and they got transplanted before people who had shorter waiting times and were very, very sick and, and were dying on the, on the, on the list. So in 1999, the Department of Health and Human Services put out what they called the final rule, stating that patients on the wait list should be rank ordered from the most to the least medically urgent, so a sickest first policy that's um, ir irrelevant to waiting time, and that the allocation policy should be based on objective and measurable medical criteria for patients or categories of patients who are medically suitable candidates for transplantation. And so that objective and measurable is also important because in that previous model where we were really just focused on wait time, it also included very subjective measures like how bad is the ascites and how bad is the hepatic encephalopathy. And that's obviously quite a subjective. And so the final rule really uh, gave us directive. This has to be a number it has to be the, the rank order is important. We have to list the sickest people first. And that led to the MELD score, which everyone's familiar with today. This was originally developed at Mayo Clinic in Rochester in 2021 to predict outcomes after the TIPS procedure in people with cholestatic liver disease. And the beauty of the MELD score is um, at least the first iteration, and I'll talk about some updates, but the first iteration was three variables the total bilirubin, the creatinine, which is a measure of kidney function, and the INR, which is a measure of clotting function. And those are three very simple blood tests. They are very reliable, reproducible. You can get them at any lab in the country, and for the most part, the lab um, value that you get is reproducible from lab to lab. There's no subjectivity in that, and it, um, the MELD score, you, you punch those three variables into an equation and it spits out the number, which is the MELD score. It ranges from six to 40. Um, six is a very healthy person with compensated cirrhosis and 40 is obviously someone with very severe liver disease. And so that was adopted by UNOS, which is the United Network for Organ Sharing for weightless prioritization in February, 2002. And this graph kind of shows us that the MELD score to this day is still the best predictor of weightless mortality that we have. So as I mentioned, the higher the MELD score, the sicker the person. And we can see here that with a MELD score of 30, 50% of those people will die within 90 days, if that kind of gives you a sense of, of um, how sick some of our patients get and how important it is to have a number like the MELD score, which really risk stratifies our patients. Now, since it was introduced in 2002, we have made some modifications based on some gaps that we've observed. The first one was that we noticed that people who had a very low sodium were experiencing higher mortality than other people with the same MELD score. And so after um, a lot of validation, the sodium was added in and that went into effect January of 2016. So at that point, the MELD score was four variables and we referred to that as the MELD sodium. Last July, we adopted the MELD 3.0, which again, it addressed some disparities in the transplant process. And now we include gender and albumin. And the reason gender is included is mostly kind of a size um, a, si a size reflection, and all, it, it, it's size and also the kidney function. Um, kidney function is a little bit different in men and women based on the amount of muscle mass and the creatinine that we use in the MELD score doesn't always reflect that, so adding in the gender kind of helped to smooth out that gap. So that's what we use today, the MELD 3.0. Now this, as you know, this reflects the 
severity of liver dysfunction. But there are some people who are in dire need of liver transplant because they ha have a high risk of mortality, but not because their liver is not functioning, because they have another, um, another comorbid condition. Liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, is the most common of this. So a lot of people with HCC have normally functioning cirrhotic liver, so they're, they're cirrhotic, but they have compensated cirrhosis. So if they were just listed on their MELD score, it would be years and years before they would be transplanted, but they have liver cancer, which is a risk for survival. And so UNOS put into place the system of MELD exception scores. And there's a very discrete list of diagnoses for which if you have that diagnosis and if you meet certain criteria as specified by UNOS, then you automatically get MELD exception points to kind of put you in the range of um, mortality risk you know, based on your mortality risk with the um, people who have that similar mortality risk from hepatic dysfunction. So it's a way to kind of equalize the playing field in terms of mortality risk. For better or worse, quality of life factors are typically not granted MELD exception points. And this is because UNOS and the people who make up the review boards um, have really strictly focused on mortality risk. And so quality of life factors, and in this disease, pruritus is usually the one that we're talking about, are almost never, in this day and age, awarded MELD exception points. That used to be different, but um, that has really changed in recent years. So how do we list patients for liver transplantation? There are a few different ways. Status one is high priority. These are people who are expected to not live more than seven days without liver transplant. So these are typically people with acute liver failure, acute decompensation of Wilson's disease, hepatic artery thrombosis after liver transplantation, or primary graft non-function after liver transplant. Typically, people with PBC do not fall into this category. People with PBC usually fall into the standard ca category, which is the calculated MELD 3.0 score. And so um, whatever your score is, that's where you end up on the list. As I mentioned in the last slide, we do have certain diseases where MELD exception points are automatically awarded. And then if you don't fit into any of these criteria, but your transplant team still thinks that you have good justification for transplantation, the team can write a narrative and submit it to the National Liver Review Board for appeal, and then they have a panel, and they review the narrative and decide whether or not they think um, the patient deserves extra MELD points to make them uh, to get them into a competitive range for liver transplantation. And the review board, their goal is to be very, very fair. And you notice it's a national liver review board. It used to be regional, and there were a lot of regional discrepancies. So now it's a national board. Their, ten, their, their goal is to equalize the mortality risk. The flip side of that is that there is no really, it's not taken into consideration at all whether a person has quality of life impairment. One thing to know about liver transplantation is there are really very few absolutes. Um, so we have very few absolute rules. We don't have an age number that's our upper cutoff. We don't have, um, everything is kind of taken into consideration with the rest of the picture. So just a reminder, <clears throat> don't ever compare yourself to your neighbor because your situation is going to be very different. And I know in the waiting room, People love to make friends and talk to the person next to them and compare stories, but your story is totally different than the other person's. So if they were approved and you weren't, you know, there's a reason for that or vice versa. Um, even in this absolute here, absolute column, they're still kind of relative, but active coronary artery disease would be a problem. We can't have somebody having a heart attack on the transplant table. So that's something that would need to be addressed before transplant. Similarly, portopulmonary hypertension is a very severe condition that um, significantly interferes with survival during the transplant surgery. Uncontrolled infection, as I mentioned earlier, you get a high dose of steroids and immunosuppression immediately after transplant. And if there's an infection that's not under control, that can have a disastrous outcome. Multi-organ failure kind of depends on the situation. If, there are, if there's a history of cancer that's other than liver cancer, um, that is often a contraindication to transplant. In general, we like people to be completely cancer-free for two, at least two years before liver transplantation. 
because similar to infection, if there's some undiagnosed um, malignancy, you know, if there are some micrometastases that we haven't discovered yet, under immunosuppression, those will really blossom and flourish, and then we haven't really achieved the goal of transplantation. Untreated alcoholism or drug use, a severe uncontrolled mood disorder that might affect compliance, and lack of social support is really, really important. Um, having a good, uh, we call it caregiver, I've learned the term care partner here, having that is mandatory. Um, I can't tell you strongly enough how important it is, and it's hard to imagine if you haven't seen it, but our people who don't have good care support, some of them die. They really, you can't get through a liver transplant with how sick people are before and the complexity of managing it during the transplant period. You can't get through it without good social support, so that is a, a mandatory feature. Um, advanced age is is all relative. We are now listing people in their late 70s on our transplant list, so that is changing rapidly. Previous extensive abdominal surgery, that would only be, you know, if, if we um, really thought that we could not do a safe transplant surgery because of previous scar tissue. Similarly, people who have significant blood clots within the mesenteric venous system, the veins that um, go into and out of the liver, uh, most of the time we can manage those in the operating room, but um, there are some people if they've clotted off all the important vessels, we just, we can't do the transplant. We don't have enough, we don't have the right vessels to hook up to. And similarly, severe mal malnutrition or frailty can be a contraindication because people can be too sick or too weak to recover from transplant. So you hear all these terms. You have to go through this transplant evaluation, and then if you've heard anything about transplant, you probably hear about how we take your information to our selection conference, and we make this decision about whether you're a candidate or not. And I know those terms sound really scary, and they sound very judgmental. And I'd like to assure you, it's really not meant to be that way. It's not a popularity contest. It doesn't matter whether we like you or not. We really just want to make sure that transplant's the right thing for you and that you're going to get through it all okay. So the goal of transplant evaluation from our standpoint is to include you in transplant, not to exclude you. And so these are, these are kind of the, the goals in summary. We, we need to ensure that your liver is sick enough to benefit from transplant. For instance, um, somebody with compensated cirrhosis, yeah, we can swap out the liver, but your liver hasn't really started to deteriorate yet, so we wouldn't actually be helping you in that situation. We need to ensure that the rest of you is healthy enough to withstand liver transplant. As I mentioned, it's a very physiologically stressful surgery, and um, we want you to do well after transplant. We need to determine if there are any comorbidities that are not barriers to transplant, but just might need to be managed differently after transplant. And we really want to position you for success after transplant. Sometimes that means that people need an extended period of sobriety from alcohol use. Sometimes that means that they need more caregivers. Um, sometimes it means that they need to gain weight or lose weight, but you know, we want you to do well. That's, that's the whole goal. Also, just, uh, just a note, if you're not approved for liver transplant, then you would either be deferred or denied, and if that happens, you will be given a very specific reason. So it's not a big mystery. Um, so for instance, um, most of our people are initially deferred upon initial presentation. It's, it's only because we don't have all the testing done. So it's usually something like, you know, they're deferred pending the results of their stress test or they're, refer, they're deferred pending getting a backup caregiver. So, so if there is a deferral, we will tell you exactly what steps need to happen for you to become a candidate. So once you're approved, then you go on the wait list. And the wait list is managed by UNOS, the United Network of or Organ Sharing. And UNET is the specific platform where people are listed for liver transplant. So all the potential recipients, or I guess all the candidates are listed in UNET. And then all the potential donors are also listed in UNET. And then the program matches potential organs with potential candidates. This, uh, again, it's a national system. The idea is to make transplant as fair and as equitable as possible to all people throughout the country. And 
it also gives us a really good way to keep track of the data so that we can do um, data analysis to make changes for the future, which um, is, is very important. The transplant is always, always changing, always progressing, and that basically comes from the data that we gather here. <clears throat> Organs are typically allocated by local organ procurement organizations, which then enter the data into the UNET. While you're waiting for transplant, again, this is going to vary from program to program. So I put the specifics of our program here, but um, your program might be different. We see people in clinic every one to six months, kind of depending. Um, for people whose MELD scores are less than 15 and they're not really having any active problems, we might see them every six months. For people who are very sick, we might see them every month or even every week, kind of just depends. We basically always get labs with every visit because we always want the most updated MELD score because if your MELD score goes up, then we immediately update that in UNET to kind of bump you up to your appropriate place on the wait list. You'll get periodic imaging, um, either CT scan, MRI, maybe an ultrasound, and again, the, that, um, the surveillance interval kind of depends on your particular circumstances, but at the minimum every six months because we're always doing surveillance for HCC, <coughs> HCC or liver cancer. And you'll also have um, appropriate surveillance for uh, esophageal varices with upper endoscopies. We continue routine health screening, so again, just the you know, usual things like um, making sure diabetes is under control, managing lipids, age-appropriate cancer screening. It's really important to eat well and to exercise while you're waiting for transplant. It's hard for people who are sick and who are fatigued and exhausted, but it's really important. It really will aid in your recovery after transplant. For people who are smoking, we request that they stop smoking. We don't demand it. Some programs demand it. And for some people, there might be random drug screens. We don't do it for everybody. Um, some programs do it for everybody. And then just to review how often your MELD score has to be updated in UNET, it depends on how sick you are, how high your MELD score is. If you have a MELD score that's 10 or less, it actually only has to be updated once a year. Whereas if you're listed as status one, it has to be updated once a week. So that chart just kind of gives you an idea and our transplant coordinators kind of stay on top of that um, to make sure that you're always in the appropriate place on the wait list. I've mentioned liver cancer a couple of times, so just a quick slide on this. Um, PBC patients develop liver cancer at a rate of about 1% to 2% per year. So it's not super common in this disease, but we see a lot of it in liver transplantation. And um, the top... I'm trying to decide. Uh, the top image is the CT scan, bottom image is an MRI. And sorry, the, it's hard to use the pointer here, but you can see on the left, you can see the kind of that bright circular area within the liver. So liver cancers, um, they enhance during the, uh, during the contrast phase, and so that's why that's kind of bright. But then as the contrast washes out of the liver, then in the next phase of scanning that we call the portal venous phase, that area goes dark. And so you can kind of appreciate that spot that's bright on the left and darker on the right. And um, liver cancer HCC is typically diagnosed on imaging and not with a biopsy. So most of the time, if we have characteristic features, that's the diagnosis and we will treat it appropriately. You may hear, um, you may hear programs talk about a MELD score of 15 is kind of being a break point as to whether or not you're ready for transplant, or they might say something like your MELD score is under 15, so um, we're not gonna list you now. Some programs I know don't even evaluate people until the MELD score is over 15. And I'm just gonna give you some information about where that comes from. It's not a hard and fast rule. Like everything else in liver transplant, everything is relative. There are plenty of people with a MELD score under 15 who we would transplant tomorrow if we had an organ for them. But the data shows, if you look at everybody who's listed for liver transplantation, the MELD score of 15 is kind of a break point. If you have a MELD score under 15, your risk of dying from complications of transplant surgery is higher than your risk of staying on the wait list. Whereas if your MELD score is 15 or over, 
your risk of dying on the wait list is higher than the risk from transplant. So that's where that number comes from. It is, like I said, not a hard and fast rule. We violate that all the time, but if you hear that, that's just, that's the background of it. Let me talk a little bit about donor organ types because there are a lot of nuances these days. Um, first of all, everybody knows the difference between a living donor and a deceased donor. And within deceased donors, we have donation after brain death and donation after cardiac death. I'll talk about those more. And then I put in quotes here, extended criteria donors. That term, extended criteria, is really kind of controversial. Um, it's a bit of an old term for um, donors that were felt to be marginal. And I'd say today, we don't think there are marginal organs or extended criteria. Um, they're good organs that we're gonna use or they're organs that we don't think would work. Um, but it's not like we offer people organs that might work or you know might get you by. So, um, but you might hear that term, extended criteria donors, and that typically refers to PHS increased risk donors. I'll talk about more, that more on the next slide. Older donors, organs that are over 70, um, organs that come with viral hepatitis or fatty organs. So first, just living donor transplant, if you're not familiar with this, in the donor, what happens, a healthy donor, two-thirds of their liver, the right lobe, is removed and put into the recipient. And so the donor is left with one-third of their liver, the left lobe, and the recipient gets two-thirds of the donor's organ. Um, and believe it or not, both organs regenerate to normal size within about three or four weeks. Living donor transplant is a great option for some people. Um, you can time it, you can, you have control over how long you spend on the wait list versus just kind of waiting endlessly if you're waiting for a deceased organ. And the long-term outcomes between living donor transplant and deceased donor transplant are comparable. So living donor transplants um, are not necessarily better or worse in, in terms of outcomes. The downsides of living donor liver transplant, there are downsides to both the donor and the recipient. To the recipient, there is about a two-fold higher risk of complications regarding biliary tree and the hepatic artery. And this is predominantly because those, um, the vessels are smaller because they're just coming from a fraction of the liver rather than the whole liver. And these are typically manageable complications, but they do happen more commonly in living donor transplantation. Also, a lot of people are eager to be a living donor, but in liver transplantation, only about 20% of people who come forward actually can be donors for various reasons. And oftentimes it's something completely unpredictable, like their bile ducts are just not anatomically in a way that will match up with the recipient's bile ducts. So most people who want to be donors will not actually be able to. For the donor, it's, there's a significant time away from their normal life. They miss, may miss out on work, which may have financial implications for them. It's possible that they could have a complication. You know, they, um, th there are sacrifices that the donor makes that are not necessarily compensated by our society and our current model. And unfortunately, there is a risk for donor death or donor need for liver transplant. This is very small. It's 0.1 to 0.2%, but it's not zero. And if you've ever been in the situation of seeing a serious complication in a healthy living donor, it is very, very sobering. You know, our recipients are sick, they need transplant. Our donors are healthy people. Um, so that's always something to be taken seriously. It's a major surgery for the donor. So living donor transplant, like I said, it has a role. It's a great option for many people but it probably is never going to be the mainstay of liver transplantation. And we can see this in, in that chart, even though the, the top line represents the total um, number of deceased donor transplants that have been done each year, and you can see that goes up every year. Um, but the bottom line, the green line, reflects the number of living donor transplants done, and that's been fairly flat. Now I'll talk about DCD organs. So the, when you think about a deceased organ, the classic type that what you think about is a donation after brain death. So that's the, the person who is brain dead, um, the heart and lungs are functioning normally, the family decides to take them off life support, they go to the operating room with the heart and lungs functioning and the organs are procured. 
And so those organs, so this is a classical deceased donation, those organs have a very, very short period of ischemic time, time when they're not getting the regular blood perfusion, and that's a controlled window. Donation after cardiac death is when the donor dies and then we harvest the organs. And the problem with this is then there is a, a longer ischemic time before the organ gets on ice or gets on the pump, and that can be damaging to the organ and specifically to the bile ducts. The way this works, if you're interested, is you know the, the donor hospital anticipates this death, and so they call in the transplant team. The transplant team stays out of the way. They have nothing to do with the donor until the donor hospital gives them permission. The person has to die, death is declared, and then each hospital has a mandatory waiting period. It's usually in the ballpark of five minutes, so they wait five minutes after death is declared, and then they have a final declaration of death, and then the organ procurement team can come in and harvest the, the organs. Um, as I mentioned, the increase in warm ischemia time increases the risk of biliary injury, which I'll give you a little more information on. Um, but DCD, the use of DCD organs is going up significantly. You can tell over the last decade we use twice as many as we used to. And in our program, almost 50% of the organs we use are DCD. So this is the Achilles heel of DCD. Transplant is cholangiopathy, cholangio refers to the biliary tree, and the ischemia that happens during um, the time out of the body. The biliary ducts are very sensitive to uh, lack of oxygen, and so they can have some damage. Now, ab about 15% of DCD recipients will develop this syndrome, the DCD cholangiopathy, and of those 15%, a third of them have DCD cholangiopathy, but it's not clinically significant, so it doesn't really cause them any problems. About a third of them um, do have clinically significant problems. They get jaundice, they develop biliary strictures, but these are manageable. We do endoscopic interventions and we can kind of get them through that. Um, and a, th a third require retransplantation. So you're probably wondering, you know, if the transplant team tells me I have an, an option when I'm offered an organ, why on earth would I accept a DCD organ? And um, there's really good data to show you're better off accepting the first organ that comes to you, that's offered to you. So this slide shows with DCD offers in particular, there's a significant survival advantage for people who accept the DCD organ versus those who pass on it and wait for a quote unquote better offer. And when we look at long-term survival of DCD grafts versus donation after brain death grafts, there's no difference in the long-term. The next topic is the, the, we call these the PHS risk criteria, so public health service risk criteria organs. So these are organs from donors who are known to have an increased risk of HIV, HPV, or HCV based on known factors either at the time of death or from their history. And when we bring this up in the clinic, I usually get a face like this because it sounds horrible and it sounds terrifying. And I would encourage you to take a deep breath and again, have an open mind because these often are excellent, excellent organs. First of all, we test for all these things. We test for HIV, for HPV and H HCV. So the only way one of these organs could transmit the virus is if they're in this very, very few day window of having acquired the virus before testing positive for it. So it's, it's like a one in a million chance that these donors could actually transmit one of these infections. These organs often come from young people. Even if an organ comes, for instance, with hepatitis B or hepatitis C that's unrelated to organ function, the organ function is perfect and we biopsy these organs ahead of time so that we know, especially with hepatitis C, we know there's no fibrosis in the organs. And keep in mind too, hepatitis C these days is curable Hepatitis B is suppressible and HIV is suppressible. Um, so I know if I, you know, if I were looking at dying from liver disease versus maybe having to be on an extra medication for the rest of my life to suppress hepatitis B or HIV, I know that I would go the route of taking the organ. Um, I think I skipped. Is it possible that? Yeah, yeah. So this is the same 
same concept as the DCD organs. So there's very good data that shows that people who take the first organ that's offered to them have better survival than people who pass up on an organ and kind of hope for a quote unquote better organ. And on the right, the graph shows that the higher the MELD score, the more significant that survival difference is. Older do donor organs. So these are organs that are greater than 70 years old. Um, similarly, these survival graphs show that the, the donor organs work just as well as younger, as younger organs. So again, no need to be concerned. I'll talk about donors with known viral hepatitis, and um, these fall into a few categories. The, the most common is what we call hepatitis B core antibody organs. So these are organs from somebody who had hepatitis B at some point in their life. That's why they have the core antibody, but they cleared the virus. And so they are not normally infectious, except that the hepatitis B virus lives in the liver. So when you move the liver from one place to another, there is a low risk of the virus recurring um, in the recipient. And so when we use these organs, and we've used these for decades, we um, automatically give an antiviral medication, and as long as the patient stays, the recipient stays on that, there's never a problem of hepatitis B recurrence. And this is really considered standard of care using these organs. A person, an organ with hepatitis B surface antigen positively, positivity, those people are infectious, and typically those organs would only be used in a recipient who already has hepatitis B. Hepatitis C, if, a somebody, if somebody has had hepatitis C, they will remain antibody positive forever. So the difference in whether they're infectious or not is whether the virus, the RNA, is detectable. So hepatitis C antibody positive, RNA negative um, organ, that's a very good organ that we use quite frequently. There's a very low risk of hepatitis C um, evolving in the recipient, and we do serial monitoring on those patients to ensure that hepatitis C does not um, become apparent. Now, a lot of what we're doing, this is not standard of care in the, in the country yet, but we're using organs with hepatitis C viremia, and these are going into all recipients, whether or not they're hepatitis C positive. And the reason for this is, again, these are often young organs, good organs, and rather than have them end up in a bucket, they go to a recipient and immediately at the time of transplant, we order the hepatitis C antiviral medications. As soon as we get them, we start them. In our program, we do a three-month regimen of one pill a day that has virtually no side effects, and we have a 100% rate of clearing the virus. We've done hundreds of these. So again, you know, it might sound scary to hear about organs coming with an infectious disease, um, but we really take a lot of precautions and we wouldn't offer you an organ if we didn't think it was ultimately in your best interest. Fatty grafts um, are grafts that can be problematic, not so much in the long term, but at the time of surgery. If there's a, a graft with a lot of fat in it, there, at the time of reperfusion of the new liver, there can be a lot of hemodynamic instability, which can create a very um, rocky um, operating period. Um, our anesthesiologists know this, they anticipate this, but it can be very significant. And so if we get an offer of an organ that has a lot of fat, we might use somebody with a lower MELD score who's a little bit healthier, who's going to do better through a rocky surgery than somebody who's very, very sick. So the, the reality of liver transplant in the United States in 2021, um, over 2,200 patients died on the wait list or they re were removed because they were too sick for transplant. So it's almost 20% of the wait list. Of those, 84% had received at least one organ offer. And most of the time, um, the, these were recipients, potential recipients declining because they were worried about the quality of the organ. And so we would, our message to you is really um, waiting for a quote unquote better organ is probably not in your best interest. And keep in mind, you know, sorry, I keep doing that. Um, the transplant center wants you to do well. And so we are not going to offer you an organ if we don't think it's gonna be a good match for you. You may have heard about the pump. Um, this has been in the news lately. So this is very, very exciting. Um, this is the first time in liver transplantation that we can put an organ, 
um, on this pump and it gets normal oxygenated blood perfused through it in a way to mimic normal human physiology. And this is going to revolutionize liver transplantation. It um, shortens the ischemia time significantly and it also gives transplant centers more time to um, arrange the transplant and such. So that's something if you haven't heard of, you're going to hear more of it. Our center was one of the first to really use this a lot and these are data that we published. So we found that in the patients that we used the pump, there was a significantly less lower risk of early allograft dysfunction, significantly less time in the OR by 30 minutes, which is significant, um, fewer transfusions both intraoperatively and throughout the whole hospital stay. So this is a very exciting development that we'll be hearing more and more of. Just briefly, um, at our program, our median hospital stay is about six days. Um, what we typically do is we follow people in clinic about twice a week for the first three to four weeks after transplant. Again, it totally depends on the individual. Um, but after a month, most people are ready to be discharged from the transplant clinic, and then at that point, they get labs once a week, which we follow remotely, and we see them at four months, and then a year after. Like I said, people go on to have really normal lives. Um, I'm out of time, so I will try to be quick with some of these. Actually, maybe I'll just skip the immunosuppression. I can, I'm happy to talk about immunosuppression afterwards if anybody wants to hear about it. Rejection, I'll give you um, one message, which is that acute cellular rejection is very treatable in liver transplantation. We very rarely lose grafts or lose patients to, uh, to rejection. So um, I always tell patients, rejection is my job. Let me worry about it. I'll see it before you'll feel it. And as long as you're getting your labs, we'll get on top of it in time and, and treat it. The postoperative complications in the first month, they tend to be surgical complications, um, complications similar to general surgery, or very rarely we have primary graft non-function, hepatic artery thrombosis, or bile leak. In the first year, um, that's the highest risk of opportunistic infection. CMV is the most common. We also see some other complications. We can always see rejection at any point. We can see biliary strictures. For people who are transplanted with cancer, like liver cancer, if it's going to recur, it tends to within the first two years, and uh, incisional hernias. And then in the long term, it's actually not problems with the graft that we see. It's problems related to having had liver disease before and complications from long-term immunosuppression. So things like chronic kidney disease, which can be progressive, de novo cancer, especially skin cancers, are very common in people after transplantation metabolic syndrome, diabetes, being overweight, hyperlipidemia, um, common problems after liver transplantation, and uh, recurrent disease we can see sometime. Again, I will skip some of these. And I will just briefly tell you, um, there's a lot of publicly available information that you all have access to. And in my experience, PBC patients are some of the most educated patients with liver disease. So you guys are the I'm sure you're probably already looking at all of this, but the SRTR, the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients, this gives tons of program information. And this is, um, this is just a quick screenshot that I took. I pulled the three transplant programs in Phoenix, and um, five bars is good, one bar is bad. It gives you the number of organ transplants done in the past year. It gives you a sense of survival on the wait list. The middle column is the odds of getting a deceased donor transplant faster and the one-year survival. Um, you can compare programs like this. You can look at program-specific information. For instance, this is my center. So at our center, almost 40% of people on the wait list are transplanted within 30 days compared to 22% nationally. Um, you can look at characteristics of people on the wait list. You can look at demographics, age, gender, race. They have just a ton of information and it's available to everybody. You can look at mortality rates. Um, the, because all the, res the candidate information is entered into the SRTR, the, they calculate what they expect each program to have in terms of their waitlist mortality, in terms of their transplant outcomes, and then they compare your results with the expected. 
And so for instance, um, you know, our expected rate for 100 person years is something like 65 and you know, we did 235 that year or something like that. So you can get a lot of information, it's all publicly available. I get asked a lot how to avoid a liver transplant. I recommend establishing care with a good hepatologist. It doesn't have to be at a transplant center, but oftentimes that's where you'll find hepatologists who are most interested in research. Take your medications as prescribed. Avoid alcohol. Alcohol did not cause your problem, but you don't want it to exacerbate your liver disease. Similarly, maintaining optimal weight and controlling things like diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia will definitely help your liver. And up to four cups of coffee today decreases the risk of liver cancer. Finally, a transplant is a team sport. We have so many people involved with our transplant program and they're all important. So you might see some of us like the hepatologist, you might see us a lot. You might never see the anesthesiologist or maybe only for five minutes, but everybody in this circle is a very important part of your care. So in summary, liver transplantation is a great option when you need it. Any organ offer is a good offer. Most complications after liver transplant are manageable and not life or th graft threatening. And there's a wide variety in liver transplant programs and if you're lucky enough to be able to evaluate multiple programs, there's a lot of information that you can access and um, get a good fit for you. So I apologize for going over and we'll take questions in a minute. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Carey. Yeah, yeah, hang out a couple of minutes. I think we have a few questions now and then we'll uh, take a little break as well. So this is interesting, I think, your discussion going through a lot of the different aspects of it, but it looks like as well there's a lot of competition in the transplant marketplace. How do, I mean, it's not like shopping car insurance, right? Like yeah. how, what's the best way to, you mentioned kind of a personality of a transplant center, those kind of things. I mean, as someone that will be eventually or in the future looking at this, what's the best way to kind of, you know, gut check? Yeah, it really depends on your individual circumstances. Um, if you're a family whose entire family, say, lives in the Phoenix area, you don't have any family in the rest of the country, <clears throat> you don't feel like you have a lot of money to spend traveling all over the country, staying locally might be the best option for you. Some people have resources to go to different areas of the country. They have financial resources to be able to fly to different programs. They might have relatives in different areas. Um, so it just, and it you know, kind of depends on where you are in your stage of life. Some people have kids at home and don't want to leave their kids for a few months. Some people might not, and they're willing to relocate to a transplant program for a few months. So it's really individual. Okay. Great, and Leslie, I think you have a question, someone read it. Yeah, someone has an interesting question about, um, we've seen in the press recently about animal to human organ transplants. Is there anything on the horizon concerning possible animal liver transplants? Mm. Not for liver, it's an excellent question and, and we ask that all the time. Um, but no, not, someday, I do think it'll happen someday, but not, not in the near future. Mm -hmm. We have one more. Are liver transplants gender specific? They are not. So in liver transplant, we match blood type and size and kind of risk factors. For instance, like a very, very fatty graft, we probably wouldn't give to a very, very sick recipient. But no, we don't match nearly as many factors in liver transplant as in other solid organ transplants. Okay, so let's um, thank you, Dr. Carey. Appreciate your conversation.